Okay, I think we might as well begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Public Knowledge Project Annual General Meeting. I am Alan Bell, the chair of the advisory committee, and I am pleased to see so many of you joining us today. And I just wanted to remind you that we will be recording today's session. Simon Fraser University, the institutional home of PKP, respectfully adopts the unceded territory, traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Kwekwetlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations on which SFU Burnaby is located. I am grateful and privileged to live on the traditional territory of the Tawasan and the Musqueam First Nations. I acknowledge all of the Halkomenum speaking people who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. I would also like to recognize that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. On January 15th, 2022, Simon Fraser University designated PKP the university's latest core facility. In joining the core facilities program, PKP will receive additional support in human resources, finance, communications, and administrative services. It also provides more certainty and benefits to some of the PKP team members working in Canada, and there are plans to review employment terms for all PKP employees in light of these exciting developments. This evolution will ensure a continuing bright future for PKP and the advisory committee will work with PKP to ensure that it remains a community-based project and makes progress on its equity, diversity, and inclusion goals. In that light, the intention is that I will step down as chair next year and help to smoothly transition and updated governance in light of these goals. PKP depends on the vibrant, passionate international community whose contributions and engagement help to make our shared infrastructures better. Your voices and contributions are everything to us and the endeavor to find and we endeavor to find ways to actively support, educate and engage the community as PKP continues to evolve. To help sure, ensure that the change is transparent and clear, I am so pleased that the inaugural operations director will be the very familiar face of Kevin Stranick, who I am delighted has returned to PKP. Additionally, Juan Pablo, Pablo Alvarin and John Walensky have been appointed as co-scientific directors of PKP. PKP also welcomed a new development partner with CLO, the Scientific Electronic Library Online, the culmination of many years of collaboration dating back to 2007, when this leading digital library and cooperative electronic publishing platform for open access journals operating in Latin America and the, uh, the Hibernian Peninsula and South Africa. We welcomed Abel Packer to our last meeting and we are looking forward to working with him. With that brief introduction, please let me outline the agenda for our AGM. First, Kevin will be providing some annual report highlights. Then John will give us some more information on the core facility. He will be followed by Eric Hansen, PKP systems developer, and Patricia Mangahees, uh, PKP client services coordinator for an introduction to the important work that the equity and inclusion team commenced in 2020. Juan Pablo, Pablo Alperin will provide us with a research update. Last, but certainly not least, Alex Mecker, PKP Associate Director of Dev Development, will provide the OJS roadmap updates. We are hoping to retain 15 minutes at the end for questions, but I encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A whenever they come to mind, so that we have some idea of the number of questions from the community. With that, Kevin, please take it away with the annual hi report highlights. All right, thanks very much, Alan. And hi, everyone. It's great to be back with all of you uh, in the PKP, PKP community again in my new role as Director of Operations. I'm coming to you from my home in Prince George, um, which is in Northern British Columbia in Canada on traditional unceded territory of the Um And, and uh, as Alan spoke so well, I also want to acknowledge that PKP is a distributed team and operates on the lands of many First Nations across Canada and that we're very grateful and respectful of that relationship. I just wanted to take a few minutes just to draw your attention to our annual report, um, which came out last month. There was a link to it in the uh, invitation, so hopefully you have that with you. Um, the upcoming speakers are gonna cover um, some of the highlights in more detail, but I wanted to draw your attention to, of course, our deepening relationship with SFU, as Alan mentioned, um, and John's gonna to dive into shortly. And Kevin, I'm sorry to interrupt. I've just heard that we are not sharing the screen properly here. I'm going to try and restart that and see what happens. Ah, thank you. You bet. While you do that, I'll talk my slides. Don't I don't have slides. <laughs> and as Alan said, this is just such an important step in PKP's evolution and will help to ensure really our long-term sustainability as a community-based research and development program. 
I also wanted to, to really emphasize that although we sh we've shifted in SFU's organizational chart um, from being in the library to being now in the office of the Vice President of Research and Innovation, we continue to have a very strong bonds with the library and a history that goes back uh, many, many years. And we have extensive areas of collaboration that continue. Uh, in addition to this organizational change, I also wanted to just give a shout out to our friends at RD at the University of Montreal, who we work in close partnership with in Coalition Publica, which is working to bring about a large scale model of diamond open access to Canada including a subscribe to open style of financial partnership between journals, libraries, and service providers in this country. And this works received generous funding from the Canadian federal government through the Canadian Foundation for Innovation and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, for which we're very grateful and whose funding helps to strengthen OJS and other PKP applications for everybody in the world. I also would just like to acknowledge all of the sustainers who continued to provide annual financial to su support to PKP over the years, um, including the newest ones, many of whom have signed up through our participation in the SCOS program, which introduced us to many new friends from around the world. And you can see that list of sustainers as well in the annual report. I too would like to welcome our newest development partner, Cielo, and their executive director, Abel Packer, who's the newest member of the PKP Advisory Committee. And I'd like to thank all of our other development partners, also listed in the annual report, for their ongoing generous support, participation, and guidance to help ensure that we have meaningful community governance for PKP. I also want to send out our thanks to the many, many community volunteers that contribute code, work on documentation, support each other on the forum, create translations, serve on our working groups and committees. So much uh, that people give. Everyone benefits from your efforts, and we truly appreciate all of your contributions. Uh, now, I wanted to just review very briefly the PKP financial report for 2021, which is in the annual uh, report as well. And you can see there where we broke the 2 million mark in revenue for the first time due to an increase in sustainers as well as a significant jump in PKP publishing services clients. On the expenses side, you can see a larger investment that we've made in publishing services including both people and infrastructure to better support the increased business, but also to build out our capacity for our continued growth that will continue to sustain our operations and fund ongoing software development and improvements. Research and development was also up slightly, reflecting work on some grant-related projects, as well as ongoing feature enhancements to all of our software. Community engagement was down a little, you can see most of that due to travel restrictions. But at the end of the year, um, we found ourselves with a 260,000 plus surplus um, doing to be, due to being careful financial managers, some of which will be set aside as a, as a contingency fund we're building up, and some of which will be invested in future software development. And just to close off my part, I would just like to um, express my deep and sincere thanks to the team at PKP both those employed at SFU, as well as all of our independent contractors around the world. It's been a challenging couple of years and the successes that are outlined in the annual report and the tremendous contribution that you're making towards building a more just, diverse and open scholarly publishing ecosystem are the result of all of your commitment, your expertise and your very hard work. So thank you all for that. And with that, I will turn it back over to Alan. Okay, thanks for that. Next, we are uh, going to John for this, uh, an update on the core facility. Yes, um, actually, I'm going to do more than an update. I'm going to give a back date. I think, Alan, a little bit of background um, on it because people have you introduced it very nicely, um, and I want to give it just a little bit of context and how important this is. And I want to recognize SFU's. Um, commitment to PKP because it is not it, it's not unnatural, but it has a history to it that's unusual. Um, our association, the PKP's association with the uh, SFU began when I was a professor at UBC. We had no other uh, involvement with SFU um, until Lynn Copeland reached out to us, the head librarian, the dean of libraries at SFU, um, with the idea that she was interested and that SFU was interested in supporting a UBC, a University of British Columbia project. 
Now you have to appreciate that UBC and SFU occupy um, that area, the urban area, as well as the traditional territories of the Musqueam and other indigenous peoples, they, there's been a bit of a rivalry at times between the two institutions. So for Lynn to reach out to me and to the Public Knowledge Project and suggest that we start a modest partnership was a significant step. And that was in 2005. It also involved the publishing program, the Canadian Institute for Studies in Publishing, um, and it was a partnership that has only grown. And Brian Owen was there at the beginning and Lynn Copeland. And we have now reached a new point. But in that period between 2005 and 2021, um, we were a project in association with the library. Um, and in 2020, at the end of 2020, uh, Gwen Bird, uh, the Dean of Libraries currently, um, came up with this idea that the core facilities was a new program at SFU. It was designed to highlight resources, um, research programs, um, elements like electron, electron microscopes and other um, tools that the rest of the university could use um, should have central support, should be part of the Vice President uh, Research and International Office. Um, and there were four or five of these at that point. Big Data was one. Um, the Electron Microscope uh, 4D Lab was another. Uh, and we approached uh, SFU's Vice President's Office, um, Dugan O'Neill in particular, with the idea that PKP was a university-wide, in fact, a global-wide um, organization, and that it was time for it to have a different kind of position in the university. Um, and so what this means then is that what was it started as a modest partnership has grown into an SFU centered project and is now recognized uh, as a core facility of the university. That doesn't mean that we are changing our role in the world or our commitment to open access in any way. It doesn't mean that we are a new organization so much as a, um, a more highly recognized within the institution organization. We are taking on more responsibilities within SFU, so we will be doing more to support publishing in SFU, though we've always been involved in that area. Um, but I think what it really does mean, and Alan touched on this, is that institutionally we are secure in a way that we weren't previously. We didn't raise that previously, of course, but we can do, we can look back now at this point and say that uh, we have grown um, substantially and that we are integral to the work of SFU. Um, SFU's sense of mission and its tagline is about being an engaged university. That is, it engages the world. And one thing that we do in terms of scholarly communication is we engage the world. We provide a platform for that world. We provide open access to the, so that the public has a right to know, public's right to know, should I, I should say, is recognized um, through open access to research. Uh, and we have grown into um, what is arguably the most widely used platform for scholarly publishing, for open access, and for diamond uh, OA journals. So out of all of that, we are in a new position to provide better and, str uh, and stronger commitment to our, our previous services. We've lost no sense of our mission. Um, and in some ways, it's business as usual, but it's a little bit more reassuring for those who are thinking about participating with us in any way as a partner, a sustainer, a user of our software. And as you'll see from Alec in the roadmap, you'll hear from Juan in terms of research, and you've already seen with Kevin in terms of our financials, um, we are well positioned. This has been a difficult period for the world, um, but in all of that research has only become more prominent. Um, the value and the public uptake of research has only become more important in light of the pandemic, for example. Uh, and we are in a sense on mission um, and in a better position than ever um, to serve that interest and that right to know. So that's our, our current state. This is, um, we're six to seven months into the core facility arrangements. Um, Kevin is the most visible sign of that in, in some ways. And we're delighted to have him back. Um, and I think you'll see other changes, but essentially you'll see a, a strengthening of what we have done. You'll see um, a little more of SFU's presence. Uh, and we're looking forward to having that support and that backing. So let me turn it back to you, Alan, and thanks for the opportunity to speak about the core facility. Great, John. Thank you so much for that. 
Uh, next, Patricia and Eric, can you uh, give us the update for the equity inclusion team? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So today we are excited to share a little bit about our equity and inclusion team and some of the work from 2021. So the equity and inclusion team was originally formed in 2020 to reflect on PKP's existing practices as well as drive changes that address inequalities and racial injustice found in and perpetuated by our organization. So to give a little bit more background about us, we are currently a team of six staff members and meet regularly to discuss these issues, develop policies and initiatives, and make recommendations. So building on our initial momentum gained since forming in 2020, the equity and inclusion team has worked on several initiatives in the past year with the goals of improving organizational transparency and prioritizing the inclusion and experiences of members of equity deserving groups within PKP as an organization, its decision-making process, leadership and community. And now Patricia will give an update on some of these initiatives. Thanks, Eric. Um, so over the past kind of year and a little bit, uh, we've worked on the, the following initiatives. Um, we've conducted and analyzed a staff survey to assess demographics and experiences of inclusion within our organization. Uh, relatedly, we've de developed a set of recommendations for management to increase employment equity and organizational transparency. We've also adopted new hiring practices to attract more diverse application and use fair evaluation and selection process. Um, and these practices have been used for all the PKP contract, um, contractor hires um, over the last year. Uh, we've also developed practices such as formal, a formal staff orientation and peer program um, to ensure that our new hires do feel supported. Um, and finally, we've implemented a new community code of conduct along with a system of reporting um, violations. And the code of conduct has been published on the PKP website and is being used on the community community forum and all of our online spaces. And while we are excited about the program's progress that we've made, we also do recognize that PKP still has a long way to go in making internal changes, as well as challenging and addressing the structural inequalities of the Canadian scholarly publishing community at large. So in doing so, we are also acknowledging the need for continuous work, reflection, and dialogue on our part that is necessary for moving forward on our paths to becoming a more equitable, inclusive, and anti-racist organization. So keeping these in mind, we've identified a few high priority goals, both short and longer term. With the upcoming strategic plan, we feel it is important to incorporate equity and inclusion work into the organization as a whole and have this reflected in the strategic plan. And looking a little longer term, we also feel it is important to develop salary scales for various roles to help ensure fairness and transparency in staff compensation. With another year ahead, we're looking forward to extending these initiatives and starting new ones, always with an eye on our larger objectives of better integrating equity, diversity, and inclusion into the core work, goals, and values of PKP. Thank you very much. Back to thank you, Eric, and thank you, Patricia. Uh, it was great to hear that very important, um, the very important work that you're uh, embarking upon. Uh, next, we have a research update from Juan Pablo Alperin. Hi, everyone. It's great to be uh, with everyone here uh, today. Um, I want to sort of update. We uh, we can maybe switch to the next uh, slide. Whoever is controlling those, just uh, start off to say, you know, it was uh, 2021 was a very productive research year, like any other. Um, I just put those sort of list of some of the publications that you can find at the end of the annual report if you want to click through to the links to some of those things. And I just want to highlight a few of the activities, uh, a few of the uh, specific things on uh, some on this list and not on this list that we've accomplished in the last year, but also point you to a couple of the upcoming things for uh, for 2022 that we have uh, we have ongoing. Um, I guess perhaps one of the, the most directly relevant to PKP or the one most directly affecting uh, the PKP community is that at the end of 2020, we released a data set of all of the um, 
um, all of the uh, articles, sorry, all of the installations and journals using uh, OJS and that data set was public, is now publicly available and out there. And actually there's been a few other people that have taken that, that data set and done a little bit of work uh, on it. And uh, we are now working together, this is led by sort of John Walensky with a few of his students at Stanford University uh, who are doing some work on actually analyzing and getting a better understanding of who are uh, where the journals are using OJS and and what are some of their characteristics and we have a few so there's been one publication that's already been out there uh, that you can see listed there and there's one that we have sort of in the pipeline for for this year but that's sort of a, the result of a lot of work from the beacon data set that we were able to create and that's something that's a feature that's in OJS that lets us know where installations exist and that data set being made publicly available it was sort of an ongoing project that we've had for a long time and I think is enabling research and enabling others to understand uh, who are the journals using uh, OJS and this large community that has been largely discounted or, or has not been visible in other in other venues. Um, other large projects, and I think we can, again, just want to sort of highlight this is that 2021 was the conclusion, if we can switch to the next slide, uh, was the conclusion of a fairly major project led uh, by me at the Scalcom Lab. So the Scalcom Lab, as you might know, is a research group that I lead that's sort of tied and affiliated with, with PKP through my um, through my role as co-director of, uh, of both of those uh, of those projects. And 2021 was uh, last year of what turned out to be a five year long uh, project looking at uh, rethinking research assessment and in particular analyzing review tenure and promotion guidelines in, uh, in the US and Canada. And this project has had a much larger uh, out uh, sort of impact and reach than I we had ever kind of envisioned when we started this project is something very small. And I just wanna sort of take this moment to highlight that. Um, accomplishments of being five years, uh, sort of five years in and seven publications into this, this project and 2021 was the concluding year with a publication on collegiality and looking at the role that collegiality has played uh, and plays within the review tenure and promotion process um, and another publication on the different, uh, the role that research data um, has been playing or in, in most instances not playing in the review tenure and promotion, uh, promotion process. Um, uh, speaking to the, what I was saying earlier, if we can just go to the next few slides, so that data set that we have been using on, uh, uh, that we were able to analyze on OJS, I just want to highlight a couple of the uh, bits of data we've been able to accomplish here. And again, here the work, uh, the credit here to, to John Ball and Sora uh, Kana, who are, were, have been doing this analysis of being able to see where OJS journals are, um, are present. And you can see our large presence in, uh, in Asia Pacific states and Latin America, as well as in Western Europe and, um, and uh, and other states so you can kind of see what the breakdown is with a large proportion of our journals in particular in Indonesia and being able to really document the rise of OJS journals in, in Indonesia. And another thing, if we can just go to the next slide as well, um, uh, you can see the, the really the diversity of languages that are published in OJS. Uh, so obviously we are not surprising to see English as being a dominant language with almost 50% of the journals, but also seeing uh, the Indonesian that I was mentioning before and the, the large and significant role also of Spanish and Portuguese with around 10% of uh, publications publishing in those languages. Um, and another thing I think that this data set and this research has been really something that we can be quite proud of here. And if you go just to the last slide on research um, is being able to see um, how much of the journals are actually publishing, not just in one language, um, but publishing in multiple. So around 45% of the journals publish in just a single language, but then you can see that uh, about 40% of the journals are publishing uh, articles in at least uh, in two languages and another 13% publishing in three or more languages. Again, so I think these are characteristics that are fairly unique to OJS journals, something that we don't see in the larger uh, literature and something that in through this research and this work with this data set that we published um, is making possible to do this kind of an analysis. And I think uh, in an area that we're continuing to work on um, going forward. Um, I wanted to sort of conclude just with this research update section, just to sort of give a sense of the larger things and some of the things that we have going on uh, in the next few years. One is that I've continued to work with one of my PhD students, Alice Freelackers, who's been doing a lot of work uh, on, uh, on looking at preprints and the role that preprints, how preprints have been covered in the news media. So we had one sort of major publication in 2021 about this, and there's been another um, two that are either, um, that are sort of preprinted now and available. Um, looking at how preprints have been um, covered in the news and what's their uptake, not just the uptake within the academic community, but also looking at their uptake within the science, uh, sort of in the, in the news and how in science, the role that they're playing in science communication. Obviously, this has been particularly important during um, the COVID pandemic as the role of preprints was very significant there. 
Um, but we're looking now beyond not just looking at COVID, but kind of seeing how perhaps the, the role that COVID has played uh, in uh, helping preprint adoption in the, in the news media is persisting uh, to other topics beyond. Um, we have another couple of projects that I think are worth highlighting that we've got in the pipes for this year. One is a small project, but I think a significant one for the OJS uh, and the PKP community, which is a small project funded through Crossref for analyzing uh, metadata and the project's called Metadata for Everyone because we're looking at how the different, uh, how metadata related to multilingualism and to different sort of things like names and how they are treated in different cultures end up featuring in metadata and what are some of the ways in which standards are being uh, applied or perhaps in some cases not enabling uh, every different cultural uh, variance in how people they wanna um, express the, the content and the research that they have is being present. So that's a project that we have uh, already ongoing. We expect to see some publications and some outputs and reports from that coming out later this year. And then two other projects that I'm leading at the Scalcom Lab. One is uh, it's gonna be a webinar series that we've got in the works um, to highlight other forms of open science practices and things that are already existing in Latin America that are open science beyond traditional research publications um, that we can already see. So look out for uh, a webinar series titled Otra Ciencia Abierta Ya Existe, so another open science is already happening, um, and another large project that we've got as a collaboration across multiple countries, uh, a project looking at uh, sort of equity and engagement with open science and seeing whether or not open science is really enabling a more equitable uh, research culture and community um, or not, and looking at that from a few different lenses. So that project, again, also something that we were able to achieve the funding for last year, and the project is now currently underway, and we expect to see some things. Um, so like I said, lots going on uh, within uh, our research work, um, but I will leave that as a highlight, and you can see some of those publications in the, in the annual report if you want to click through and read some of the, some of the work. Thank you. Thanks, Juan, for outlining the impacts and uh, all the great work that you're doing. That's fantastic. Next, we have the OJS roadmap updates with Alec. Alec, take it away. Thanks, Alan. Um, so uh, in addition to the, uh, the place, the uh, First Nations that uh, SFU's um, on the unceded territory of, the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil uh, I'm currently on the territory of Lekwungen, Wasanich, and Coast Salish peoples. Um, we're doing some work within PKP on decolonization. We formed a group to discuss that as a broad subject. Um, I'm personally a member of the Métis Nation, but was not raised with uh, a connection to that culture. Um, and we'll, after educating ourselves about uh, decolonization as a subject, we'll be looking at the relationship between uh, dissemination of knowledge and traditional knowledges and uh, um, the work that we do more professionally. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to become better allies to Canadian First Nations and uh, Indigenous peoples around the world as a result of that work. Um, so PKP roadmap. Um, when we talk about the PKP roadmap, we're normally talking about this spreadsheet that you see in the background essentially which is our public articulation of our high level goals for OGS, OMP and OPS um, but actually there's a lot more going on when we talk about the BKP roadmap um, just because of the sheer number of projects uh, that we we have going at any particular time so I've tried to strike a balance here between um, focusing just on the software and actually the title on the agenda here was originally OGS roadmap we always give OPS and OMP a bit of short shrift so um, I want to include those, but also the variety of side projects we also have on the go. So this is a summary of the uh, third, fourth quarter of last year and the first and second quarter of this year. Um, as you see, there's a smattering of OGS, OMP and OPS releases there. We're continuing to maintain the 3.3.0-X line of releases, um, but there's a lot of other things going on as well. Um, I did take a look through to see what uh, plugins, for example, are coming both from PKP and from our various uh, partners and, and friends in the community. And there were just too many to list uh, without um, picking favorites. So I do apologize for those whose names I didn't put on here, but there are lots. Um, there were plugins from Lepidus, University of Pittsburgh, many others. Um, OGS in the third quarter of 2021 became ORCID certified for its integration. And that's a really big step for us because the ORCID integration is, um, is very important to a lot of our users. But also, uh, if you'll permit me a brief tangent, um, as an open source software vendor, often that kind of certification is very difficult for us because the certifications tend to go to the platforms. So uh, a user of the software would have to become certified. Um, but in Orkin's case, they, they saw the value in what we're doing and the prominence of the platform and extended their certification program to include us. So the OGS integration with Orkin is now certified, um, which is a huge step forward. Um, Eric was mentioning some of the, and Patricia were mentioning some of the ENI team's um, uh, work in the last year. 
Um, we did publish uh, a code of conduct in the, in the fourth quarter of 2021, and that's a big piece that we now have brought into uh, the public forum, but also to events that we hold like sprints, of which we were lucky to hold uh, two this year. Um, we did publish that beacon data set that uh, Juan mentioned in the fourth quarter last year. And that's that's really huge. It's um, a big subject and there's a really comprehensive blog post on that work. But essentially, because we're open source and don't require any kind of uh, registration, and I've been very careful about subjects like telemetry, um, understanding who the user community is for our software is a research project. And so we finally took that on in a way that produced some results. Um, Juan showed those from a geographic and linguistic perspective, and I'll show a few results in a minute from a, an OGS software version management perspective, which is a bit of a, a wonk subject, but um, has helped us to set some priorities and, and make some technical decisions. Uh, in the first quarter uh, this year, the um, upgrade guide was published. This is work that the um, technical committee has been working very hard on, and I'd like to, to thank all those folks for, for their work. We did retire the PKP index. Um, we announced uh, an LTS release, which I'll, I'll mention what that means in a few minutes. That's long-term support. And uh, just to pull out one plugin in particular, we did release, um, or I don't even recall this is a third-party contribution. I'll, I'll give credit to a third party for this one because I don't recall if it was ours. But there's a Roar plugin, a uh, uh, research object. I don't even know what it stands for. Essentially, identifier for institutions. And uh, that's something that's been waiting for a long time. Um, we are focusing... Uh, at the moment and in the next uh, couple of quarters on the release of OGS, OMP and OPS 3.4. And towards the end of this uh, screencast, I'll show a couple of screenshots of that as well. Um, and that's a tremendous amount of work, which will have to be its own series of blog posts on what's coming next there. Um, I wanna speak for a couple of minutes about uh, LTS, that's long-term support releases and upgrades, because this is a big subject for us. And this ties together also the, uh, the beacon data that I was mentioning before. Um, this is a summary of what um, software is out there in the wild. What, uh, this is primarily OGS users, but also does include some level of OPS and OMP. Um, this is uh, on the bottom axis here, this is uh, uh, by version, so from older to newer. So you can also think of this as um, uh, a time series. Um, and then on the, the vertical axis, there's the number of, uh, of journals out there. Um, and so you can see within each family of releases, 2.4.x, 3.0.x, et cetera, um, there's kind of a bell curve. Um, showing um, active uh, users. And there's little arrows here to indicate just how old that software is. So this should be um, painting a picture of an ecosystem that has a lot of old software running. In some cases, very old software. Um, if you're running a, a version of OGS 2.x, the, the newest release from that was quite some years ago. And uh, if you think back in the, the dot-com terms of internet years being, I think, seven <laughs> um, chronological years, that's prehistoric software. At uh, the top here, there's this red and green bar. This indicates what we do and what we don't support. So this shows that a large portion of users are out there using unsupported versions of the software. So uh, what does this mean? Um, the average OGS user is probably using an obsolete version. So think about that. That's not just the person who's managing it, the editor, the person who installed it, uh, the, the copy editor. That's authors and that's readers. Um, the community impression of OGS is probably on a piece of software that's about five years out of date. Um, that was true in November 2021 when that data set was first published. It's probably gotten a little better because I've seen a lot of consolidation around the 3.3.0-X line of releases, which is exactly what we want to see and, um, and ties into the LTS uh, discussion, which I'll, I'll go through in a minute. Um, but these users, and these are you know readers, authors, everybody, are frequently encountering old, already fixed bugs and are probably requesting from us to add features that have already been implemented and released for potentially several years. Um, the authors of plugins, we really want to support a third-party uh, plugin ecosystem. They have to think hard about what version to support. If they need to try and hit the peaks of those bell curves to get the most user uptake for their work, then they've got to decide which versions to support, and they may not um, support the newest versions if those are, are not yet receiving as much uptake. Um, and I think this, this ties around the idea that institutions have been confused about how to schedule upgrades. The, the upgrade schedule has been sometimes too aggressive. There's been confusion about whether a new version has been uh, stable enough to use right off the bat, that sort of thing. So uh, what are the root causes here? I think there are two, and I'll just uh, highlight these in the, the data set here. Um, these represent, these big leaps here represent the major shifts to, uh, to changes, to versions of OGS that have uh, major changes in them. Um, and each one of these is its own little bell curve, you'll see here, which essentially means to me that um, people are treating these as if they were in fact entirely different applications and not running the upgrades between them as much as we would like to see. 
Um, and I think the reason for that is that upgrades are hard. We know that historically upgrading OGS, um, OMP and OPS as well has been difficult. Um, there have been bugs, it's taken a long time. We've worked with one or two partners that uh, have found that their upgrades in large installations literally take days and many days sometimes to perform the upgrades. So we've been doing a lot of work on that, which I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, but that's definitely a problem that we're aware of that's long-term that we've put a lot of work into and uh, you should start to see the fruits of that work. Um, uh, well, it's in 3.0 essentially, but you won't notice it as much until you upgrade from there to 3.4. Uh, but the second problem is that resources are scarce. So within each one of these bell curves, um, you'll see a, a, a bell curve like shape. And then on the right hand side, you'll see a peak where folks were able to upgrade to the newest um, release in a particular line of releases. That upgrade to the newest release in a line of releases is actually a very easy upgrade to do relative to um, an upgrade across major releases. So you do see a spike at the end there where folks were able to keep their installations up to date without having to tackle some of those technical challenges that come with a larger upgrade. But the remaining bell curve here shows that people that basically installed the software and left it in that state and did not maintain it. And I think this just reflects the fact that in our community, it's really hard to get the resources to maintain uh, this software. And we're aware of that challenge as well. So um, we're doing our best to make sure that the upgrade process uh, gets easier, gets more stable. Um, we're trying to help institutions to plan on a slower upgrade cycle. And um, this is the goal of the LTS line of releases. Um, the LTS releases uh, will allow you to choose a branch of OGS, a stable version that you know will be maintained and uh, predictable for a period of three to five years. But for those who want to um, upgrade on a more aggressive cycle, who want um, kind of latest and greatest features, that sort of thing, that existing track will be available as well. Um, but yearly uh, major releases are too aggressive a cycle for most of the community to adopt. And so the LTS line of releases will help to, um, to make that possible. Um, we do want to make upgrades faster, more reliable. As we can see, when users can't easily upgrade, they probably won't. And we'd like to clearly articulate what our support window is. Um, it's been unclear how far back PKP supports uh, older versions of the software. And we're, we're working towards articulating that, artic articulating that much more clearly. Um, and that will help the community hopefully to plan around upgrades um, in correlation with their publishing schedule and their technical resources and uh, consolidate um, more of the community on fewer versions of the software. Uh, so LTS releases, um, I've mentioned this a couple of times. There's a blog post outlining, uh, outlining what this means for you. And uh, essentially, if you are a software service provider or you're an institution that would like a three to five year upgrade cycle, this will give you a very well supported, very stable, very reliable platform to, to um, use on that slower release cycle. And otherwise, it means that we will still, of course, be releasing more aggressively with our um, with our faster releases, but they won't uh, they won't um, depend on on folks to stay update in order to stay stable. So upgrades, uh, I'll just give you a couple of icons here. The 3.2.x upgrade process and previous was very slow, as I mentioned. Starting with 3.3.x, it's a lot faster and more reliable. Um, we'll be publishing some blog posts about this as well. Um, but as I say, once you're on 3.3.0, you will have crossed the Rubicon. You'll have crossed that threshold of older upgrade technology and everything from there onwards will be a lot more uh, responsive to upgrades and a lot more reliable. If you're running 3.3.0, you already have that new code in place, but you won't actually see it in action until you upgrade to the next release. So uh, we've made some major strides on that. Um, okay, I'd like to speak for a few minutes about uh, community and planning. Um, and this screenshot here is our GitHub issue list. It's frequently unhelpful. Um, it's often very technical and it's difficult to wade through it and determine what's important for you to know as a user, as a community member, as a contributor of, uh, of information on what it means to do an open review, uh, what problems you might be encountering technically, but knowing that our community is often um, under-resourced in terms of technical resources um, and overburdened with a wealth of knowledge on how the publishing process uh, works and who your constituent users are and all that sort of thing, um, it's incumbent on us to make it more friendly and clear what we're working on. So, uh, historically speaking, there was this question, where is OGS going? What is PKP doing? What are our priorities? And what's always been around to answer that question is the uh, GitHub issue list. But as the screenshot here shows, it's often very technical and kind of unapproachable. So in 2020, we, really, we, we launched the PKP roadmap, which is that, uh, um, that spreadsheet that I, I showed briefly earlier. 
and it provides a very high level view of what the priorities are for each version of the software. Um, it does link down to the GitHub issues and, and uh, from there you can get into the weeds of what we're working on at any particular time, but it left this big gap in the middle. And what we're doing right now is we're adopting some tools that are essentially project management tools that are launched recently in GitHub uh, called GitHub Projects Beta. And what this is, is a chance to collect um, and present uh, the low level details of what we're working on from different uh, stakeholder perspectives. And I know stakeholders is a term that causes uh, some folks to, to bridle a little bit. What I mean by that is just that we have a number of partnerships, we have a number of grants, we have a number of internal groups that uh, are looking for certain features that might be the hosting team. It might be feature requests coming from the support team that recognize common uh, issues in the forum. And then there's also um, uh, the, the, the world at large asking for things. And each one of those um, has overlapping requirements that we need to try and prioritize. And this allows us to articulate those different perspectives much more clearly and then get from the high level roadmap down to the GitHub issues where the, the work gets done um, with smaller steps in between. In organizing our work, um, this is uh, mostly uh, work that's being um, spearheaded by Nate Wright right now. Um, We've historically had way too many GitHub issues. We've been really good at inviting folks to file those and request features and to uh, post their issues that they're running into and to engage with us um, on that level if they're willing to. But it's led to a huge backlog of, I think over a thousand GitHub issues with no real distinction between those that are uh, kind of ready for work and those that are not. And so what we're doing is we're splitting those into three different places. One is into GitHub discussions, which is where We'll have more developer-oriented uh, conversations. Um, all folks are welcome, of course, but they will be more technical there. There's uh, a feature request section in the forum, and uh, there's a blog post on this recently. If you're posting a feature request, we'll be directing you to the forum to do that. There's a voting feature there as well that allows you to indicate if somebody else has posted something for a feature request that you give it your support. And then there's, of course, the GitHub issues list, but it'll be hopefully a lot smaller and focus much more on the kind of shovel-ready work. And the flow of that uh, work from future requests and GitHub discussions will be when they're ready for us to begin work and to begin scheduling, all that sort of thing, they'll flow from the future requests forum and the GitHub discussions into the GitHub issues. Um, uh, this is a few screenshots of things that are coming in 3.4. 3.4 quarter of next year. Um, there's been just a couple of things that have taken longer than expected, but the work that's going into that release is gigantic. And it's been very tempting for us to cram in just one more change because there have been so many that um, that have gotten us, well, frankly, very excited about what we can do with the software now that we couldn't before. Um, so in quarter one, uh, well, quarter four, you're, you can expect to see a release candidate in our usual community, community testing process. Um, but coming at 3.4, there's going to be a major stats rewrite. And this is uh, Bojana Bokan's work. Um, this is a rewrite of institutional statistics. So you'll be able to uh, request kind of a perspective from a, a, um, a um, what's the term we're using here? Uh, from a, a client or a customer, I forget what the term we're using is. Um, and this is Sushi and Counter5. Um, we cannot say we are Counter5 compliant because the compliance needs to go with the, um, the host. Um, but uh, this is allowing us to do um, uh, uh, customer perspective, geo perspective um, in a way that we have not been able to before and uh, delivered via Sushi. Um, this is a rewrite of the DOI. Uh, infrastructure, which uh, Eric Hansen was primarily responsible for. This is funded by Crossref in part, and uh, Nate Wright's been shepherding this through as well. This drew the DOI interface and uh, some of the Crossref tools out of their kind of scattering through the software into a single place where you can see DOIs for articles, for issues, etc., all presented in one place. And this work was coded over the last numerous months and presented to Crossref just recently, and uh, it's, it's looking very, very good. Um, the last piece I'll show is uh, primarily Nate Wright's work with uh, some help from uh, Vitaly, um, one of our other developers, um, Bezsheko is his last name. And uh, this is a rewrite of the email composition tool set, but also the way that we handle editorial decisions. And there's a lot of things here that are knit into one um, screenshot. So I'll just take a moment to point a few of those out. One is that there's um, a, a more designerly approach to some of the features here that were previously glued on a little bit. Um, and I will say we are, we have, recently hired our first actual designer, which I'm very excited about. We have a number of folks on the dev team who are talented as designers, but we've never actually had a dedicated designer. Um, that person's starting with us in uh, late August, and I'm, I'm very excited to see how we rework our, our workflow so that the design work comes up front, as opposed to someone like me, who's a primarily a developer, um, improvising an interface as I code, um, which is not the ideal way to come up with a coherent interface. But this is a, a coherent view uh, at a few 
common feature requests. Uh, one is for better ways to control your language that you're working in. As you see, there's a switch to French icon down here. There's a better um, implementation of ways to choose different email templates. You may have some that are built in from the software. You may have written some of your own. And uh, last but not least, there's also uh, a tool here to add additional recipients to emails, which is a very frequently requested uh, ask. Um, this is already written and will be coming out in 3.4. Um, and I think the experience will be very intuitive once you start working with it. I believe we're on to the questions and answers section. Great. Thanks, Alec. That was fantastic. My first one of these, Brian told me that most people were here for that portion of this meeting and that you, you delivered again. Thank you so much. Um, so we are at the Q&A and there are no questions at the moment. So this is a little awkward, but I'm hoping that since we are here and you might have some now, if you do, please pop them in to the Q&A and we'll take a look. I think that's the only way for people to do it, right? There's no, there's no way to unmute yourself and do it. Sorry about that. So we'll wait just a few moments here. If anyone didn't get to something that they wanted to say in one of their sections, they could certainly pop in and do that now too. But yeah, that was great all from all of you. Thank you so much for um, all the great work you're doing. Okay, now I'm getting a little uncomfortable. That might be it, Alan. Maybe we That's answered all the questions. Oh, here we go. We did <laughs> oh, get to questions. Andrew. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thank Andrew. you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so Andrew Gearhart asks, how are long-term support releases selected? Um, so this is a new policy for us. And uh, as I mentioned, this was developed um, with the initiative of the, uh, of the technical committee, which is a group of... Um, some folks from PKP, but also a lot of uh, third-party hosts, primarily institutions that uh, have some coding capacity and are interested in, in steering the software. Um, so uh, we designated 3.3.0 as our first LTS release. And um, that was because it was a priority for us to, uh, to establish a, a, a smoother upgrade track for those who didn't want to upgrade so frequently. And the LTS was ready for it. And our, our guidelines were that we wanted to have um, the LTS branch be stable and maintained for a period of three to five years. So um, we have not yet chosen what the next LTS will be, but what we're gonna do is um, towards the, uh, the, the shorter end of that three to five year track, we'll be looking at what our, our next release um, pipeline is going to be and designating another release as an LTS release. The process we followed with 3.3.x was that we released 3.3.0. And in the past, we've had a history of um, releasing a major release of the software and then sort of letting it prove itself. And I know this isn't a fair thing to do to the community. Um, it's reflective of the fact that we've not had a good enough testing process. And so the perception has been, um, and to some extent accurate, that new releases of the software are not stable. And so we've been doing a lot of work within the PKP tech committee, within the dev team, also within a, a subcommittee of the testing committee, of, of the tech committee called the testing committee, on ways to make sure that initial releases of new software are, are stable right from the get-go. But it's likely that we'll continue to have um, a period of time after a major release comes out um, before it's identified to be a good candidate for um, an LTS release. So for example, 3.3.0 is an LTS release, 3.4 will not be, 3.5 will not be. It's entirely possible that 3.6, uh, maybe some months after its initial release will be designated as the next LTS. But that gives us some extra time to, uh, to make sure that the software is stable, that it, the dependencies are going to serve us long-term because we have um, increasingly a lot more use of third-party dependencies. And so if we're committing to a three to five year release cycle, we need to make sure that those are also gonna be capable. And we'll also have some time to spend a bit of extra uh, polish on the, the upgrade process, knowing that we're gonna have uh, not just folks upgrading from let's say 3.5 to 3.6, but from that LTS 3.3 to 3.6. And that's quite a long window for upgrades. Um, I see a second question here. Are there any plans for integration with iCal tools? Um, I do not believe we have any current plans for that, but if you have a follow-up question about um, what specific integration you've got in mind, that would be uh, welcome. Any more questions? Uh, and let me just add. Oh, okay. uh, Go ahead. 
I know a lot of folks are, are touching on some bigger subjects. I know that the presentation, we touched on a lot of big subjects. These tend to be covered in the PKP blogs. So if you're interested in a particular subject, believe me, there's exhaustive reporting on, uh, on each of these subjects there, including LTS, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while we're waiting for another question to come in, I just would like to mention that uh, after two years not doing PKP sprints, we were able to return to doing those uh, this June, actually. We, we tried to pack two years worth of uh, missed travel opportunities into one month, which I don't recommend we do again, but we were able to travel to Helsinki and um, with the help of NTUC Nygaard and the Finnish Federation of, I'm terrible with acronyms today. Um, <laughs> I'll get, get this one in a second. Uh, we were able to hold a sprint in Helsinki, which uh, attracted a really nice set of folks from all over Europe, um, who I'm sure will be working with, uh, respecting we'll be doing more sprints in some of these places fairly soon. Um, we also went to, uh, to Colombia and did a sprint in, in Bogota, um, thanks to the National University there. Um, it was really good to see the community again, a lot of uh, folks that we hadn't seen for a few years that are good friends of ours, also a lot of new folks. And I have to say, particularly in the, um, the, the Latin American context, the breadth and energy of folks there is, is fantastic. New people I had not met before. Um, I'm sure Juan Pablo Alperin and um, Alejandro Casas are, are much more familiar with that community, but a lot of energy there. Um, there's a series of sprint reports there on the specific achievements, and I think a couple of summary posts that will help to uh, articulate, but um, some good work there. Uh, I see a follow-up here um, about the iCal question. The idea is to create other tools to communicate with the activity with community, especially reviewers and authors, where they could see their activities out of their calendar software. Um, I'm not familiar with that, but uh, we, I would certainly follow up on a future request and discuss that in more more detail. Great, thanks. So I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll wait just one more boom. Oh, here we go. 3.4 seems to be one of the biggest changes made by PKP without being a major release like 4.x. PKP thinks of minor changes from 3.5 version and beyond. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So I, I intentionally didn't go into some of the technical details of what's going into 3.4, but um, uh, just to mention a couple of them, um, the code has been significantly rearranged into, uh, into namespaces. Uh, every file has been renamed uh, just to facilitate some more modern uh, practices around auto-loading. Um, we're making use of a lot more of the Laravel tool set, so queues, for example, um, as opposed to our own tool set that was developed, um, you know, 10 years ago. In some cases, the code is quite old. Um, and once you're making changes that rearrange the code, it's very tempting to, um, to get all those changes done all at once, and so you don't uh, require third-party developers to kind of take those steps over a few subsequent releases. Um, so it's been a bit of a party in um, adopting modern coding practices uh, on a very large code base, which is a lot of work. Um, likely we're going to step back from making those kinds of changes for the 3.5 release in favor of some of the really uh, feature intensive changes that we've had uh, we're pending for a while. And this is part of what's got me so excited about working with a designer for the first time is that we've got these, what we're calling bundles of features that um, we've collected, uh, for example, related to the author's experience, to the review process. Um, and the goal here is to avoid just sticking additional new features on the pile um, until the software collapses under its own weight, but rather to approach these sets of features as a coherent uh, suite. And that's gonna require some design expertise. And we're really happy to be working with that person starting, starting in August. So. That work's going to be uh, very heavily reflected, I think, in the 3.5 and 3.6 releases, um, and less so the technical reorganization, which is going to permit a lot of um, uh, future benefits, but uh, won't be probably so visible in 3.4 uh, as it is to the dev team. Great. Thanks for that, Alec. I'll wait one more moment to see if there are any other questions. They do seem to pop in at the last minute here. Um, so one more second, but if not, if there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for what they carefully prepared today. Uh, and I hope uh, the community can agree that uh, the future for our shared infrastructure is secure and is in very good hands as well moving forward. Uh, so thank you all for coming again to the annual general uh, meeting and uh, thanks to the speakers. And with that, we can close the session. Thanks again. Thank you, Alan. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank